Camera speed. Sound speed. Ten apple, take two. Oh, good. Thank you. Here we go. And action. Myself and Carl, we were making short films back in 2012 and we made a whole bunch of them. Um, and it got to the point where we were kind of like, we need to make money, we need to make like a feature film, we need to actually get established in the industry. Solace was an idea I had um, that kind of came about um, as it's kind of like a mathematical equation of the perfect for me, the perfect debut film. It kind of had that high production value, but minimal production cost. We're nobody, so we needed someone behind the camera, someone with us that could guarantee, you know, these guys aren't idiots, that someone who had weight behind them, who was, you know, who had made a mark for himself. And we loved uh, Moon, um, even though Moon and Solace had nothing in common at all, but we liked how Tony Noble, who was a production designer on Moon, we liked um, how we handled that film, and it's it's a good quality that we thought, yeah, it, Tony would be good for Solace. So Tony's involvement really was there right from the start, and with Solace, it took three years from concept to actually getting the film funded and shot. And that three-year process, you, you're just talking about things, and it's not till someone actually says, "Here's a lot of money, go and go ahead and make it." That's when it really takes off. But before that, we're just purely discussing the script, thinking about things, looking at, you know, basic um, reference, film, film references, um, to, as I say, formulate some kind of look and, um, and style of the film. Stephen, um, it was quite a similar thing, actually. Uh, Carl had um, been playing Grand Theft Auto, so GTA V, where Stephen played a character called Trevor Phillips. And we both really, really were very impressed with Steven's performance in that game because a lot of people don't realise that instead of just lending your voice to a character, Steven actually lent his whole physical performance. It was motion captured. Um, so again, we phoned up Steven's agent and said, could you please uh, forward this script to him to have a read of? And literally within a week, he was calling us to say how much he loved the project and how much he would love to be on board. And then eventually had Stephen on the phone, which was weird having Trevor on the phone. Probably about three years ago, I received an email from Carl. Basically, I ended up one morning, uh, my son was asleep beside me, country place, serenity, peaceful, beautiful. 6 a.m., I decide I'm gonna read the script and I was just, just crying like a baby at the end of it. It just really moved me uh, on a really deep emotional level regarding the emotional journey of, of what we have to go through in life and death and all of this. And, and with my son there, it just resonated and it was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was incredible. So I was like, wow, that's amazing. Type back, hey, nice fucking script. The psychological journey and the journey of, of a man is what appeals to me because this could be in a lifeboat, could be in a cabin in the woods. This just happens to be set in space. It's not about space. So the space setting came actually as the least important thing. It is in a space film, essentially, it's just a survival film. But he regrets his past. He regrets, um, obviously, he's lost his son and he regrets how he's handled it. You know, obviously, he split up from his wife because of it. He kind of regrets a lot. He's on a journey of just, he needs to say sorry, that's all he needs to do. And Roberts introduces him to the idea that maybe she doesn't want to hear sorry, maybe she actually just needs you. She was there to certainly be someone who's different. It's sort of the pessimist and the optimist that meet and share and connect and end up transferring in ideas and sort of, not philosophies, but outlooks on life that allow him for the first time to see it. So. She is an enormous part of his journey. She's the hero of the film, uh, and Holloway's the damsel in distress who needs saving. He wouldn't, I don't think, complete the journey on his own. He needed someone like her to help him transform. Uh, she, you know, he even helps her in a way because she lost her husband um, in a similar way, who just gave up. 
Um, so it's about not giving up and it's about hanging in there. And there's this pure love that essentially happens, which I didn't initially find in it. It wasn't until the end that like it, in order to find this pure love, there was this transfer between them that was really beautiful where she gave him this gift to see something, to see life differently. Uh, we didn't actually meet Bart until really late, just a few weeks before we actually were shooting the film. We are looking for the right DP for the project and a friend of ours had starred in a music video that Bart had DP'd for. So I called up Bart out of the blue and I said, I really liked your work on this short film. Um, would you be interested in reading this feature film that we have? A purely professional relationship. Bart understands me, I understand Bart. And his work just really, really speaks for itself. We love his use of lighting, his, his camera work is amazing, and he just really has that kind of uh, feel for what he's doing and a real, a real love for it as well. I find it very easy to work with him. Um, he's brilliant. I think we we're about a week away from crowdfunding. I think we had a Kickstarter page all set up, ready. We had all the material and the package all set. The whole film was storyboarded, every scene I'd done. Um, pencil sketches of little stick men uh, and Andrew Lamb done the um, storyboards all in colour. We had them in colour, the storyboards, because of the light changes. I needed, you know, on set to know exactly if the sun is in view or if it's not in view. And Tony put us in touch with a studio called Goldfinch Studios, um, who he had recently worked with. And he said, you know, you guys should send your script over to them and see what they think. But at that time, we had had all of this um, concept art done. We'd had um, a, even a musical sketch piece um, to really support the film. And we were literally ready to shoot. Um, so the studio saw that, saw our preparation, saw our readiness. And they were like, yeah, let's do it. It's kind of difficult these days because films are very difficult to get made. You know, low budget movies are quite difficult, but uh, they managed to achieve it, which is amazing and remarkable, really. And then all of a sudden, looks like something's happening with this. And boom, here we are. To bring the production and the production design down to a lo-fi quality, you could kind of get away with more. Tony and I had already formulated what the film was going to look like. Uh, and he had, had got those movies that from sort of 80s and 90s, which he wanted to try and recreate. Um, you have got, you have this kind of grimy, greasy look to it, which always looks interesting, I think, anyway. When it came to designing the sets, um, we had, very early on, we had a co uh, concept artist who was kind of taking the ideas out of my head, and uh, the corner chamber was originally much bigger, and but obviously budget restrictions crunched all that down. Uh, and actually, I prefer it how it is now. It's much more claustrophobic, and floor and ceiling of the uh, coolant chamber was plastic stacking pallets. The art department, which were amazing, they just dressed everything up as quick as they could to make it all look uh, not just metallic, but really cold. So once we had the uh, Capura designed on the outside, when it come to building the set, we couldn't build the whole thing, obviously. We just didn't have the money to build all of the outside, so we just took a segment. And that segment is literally just the pathway Holloway takes from the hatch to the front where he welds and then the route back. So the inside of the escape pod, I'd done a sketch and then we took that sketch of the inside that I'd done and we designed what the inside could look like and it was very round, it was just a, the inside of a ball and we had seats on the ceiling to suggest zero gravity and that was an idea for a long time. Eventually we found that the set couldn't fit our round pod in, so we actually had to squish it down into an eye shape, which I still liked because I found it quite symbolic in Holloway being able to, his inability to see. Tony came on board, he done his blueprints of the set, and then um, the team got together and started building it. The front of the escape pod could come off, that could be wheeled away, like a giant Pez dispenser it could open up so we could get inside. And then the seats themselves, we actually just got um, gaming chairs and we just put them into MDF frames. So the props we wanted to make as practical as possible. So the stat band that Troy wears is fully practical. It's actually an iPod uh, with an app that um, was specifically created for the film that he could interact with. We got early concept art of Holloway's jumpsuit and design, uh, and then Frankie designed her costume, and I was really pleased with the result. I thought it looked really good, very action figure. 
I've often said that my two main influences for this film were Red Dwarf and Alien. Myself and my uh, wardrobe assistant, Christina, made four of the jumpsuits in roughly a week. And that, of course, includes distressing and adding age marks and making everything look, like I said, like it's been worn for a good few years. Only having to worry about costuming two characters is in one way a relief because it means a smaller workload. In another way, it's massively more intimidating because you can't you can't hide anything in the crowd. I really enjoyed reading the script. I thought it was a lovely journey for a character to go on and I was quite interested in the concept of one man in a spaceship. We don't include Milton. <laughs> but obviously Milton was of interest to me as well. We had Mark Coulier making uh, Milton's head and hands, who is fantastic, a very big award-winning prosthetic makeup designer. Because one of the ideas that was uh, banded around was was to actually cast Carl and have him as Milton um, but we were quite short on time and money and we decided to uh, use a generic head and I knew that if I could get Mark Coulier interested and on board it would be brilliant but he's pretty battered most of the film to be honest it's difficult to do a makeup like that and it not be too distracting for the audience things change the makeup like lighting settings and what he's wearing and but what i decided to do when when i realized we we were using blue lights red lights orange lights it cancels out the the colors that we put on his face and because he's got lots of bruising with all them colors in quite often cancelled out everything that i was doing but the information is there, so they can choose in the edit to bring up those colours that are there. We've got wire effects, and um, of course being in space we have to create the weightlessness uh, effect. So we've got a couple of uh, rigs that we'll, we'll play. Uh, Artem effects have done an amazing job on this film. They are a special effects company, so they do all, everything practical. Artem's clever thinking, we were able to make something work for very little money. And remember, the rear units are outside the protection of the radiation chamber that encompasses the EEV cabin. Yeah, so make it snappy again. Yeah. 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 Under my armpits, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's good. Though. Okay, so right like that, because that's how I'm. I'm not gonna be supermaning it. It's gonna be mostly in here, just like. Okay. Yeah, for me to get this headset on. Sure. Yeah. Roll, please. Pass Hey, that will take two. Mark. Make board. Set. Three. Two, one, try. Ah, ah, ah. Uh, Commander Robert, repeat. Ah, half or eighteen, repeat. Ah, ah, ah. Commander Robert. Ah. Ah. Cups, thank you. Uh, does it look like I'm pushing it or does it look like I'm pushing it? got the cup in the uh, Well, we, we will read this shot without the palette. It is just a frequency. Yeah, button. okay. So, let's roll, please. Sounds good. Eight kilo, take four. Mark it. Take four. Thank you. Stand by. And action. Cut. And let's cut it. Set. And camera action. And all. Uh, yeah, Roberts, I think I'd rather die right. than put my suit on again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right on. Is the backpack entirely going to be gone? For this one shot, you won't be having it at all. But then, okay, after. So you just then after you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, it's cool, man. Leaves of 31 March, take two. Guide track, 30 frames. Thank you.
So the exterior of the pod. And action. The most challenging thing of that was the space. We had to really be creative about camera angles, moving around, having Stephen move in particular ways to kind of achieve what we needed to achieve story-wise as well as visually. Cut. Thank you. Thank you. Else, can I? Can we see playback? What's the uh, dump in the shade? Three, two, one, action! It kind of went up nearly just a few feet from the ceiling, it was a few feet from the walls. So when Stephen's hanging from the wires on top, he is as high as the wires can go. The biology's changed. That's when the credit really does go to the visual effects guys who had this absolute nightmare rubbing out everything and Stephen done a really good job because that set got so hot obviously heat rises so Stephen was kind of in this inferno on top of the set we had problems with dripping with sweat there's no you're not meant to sweat and it's fine because Stephen was actually dying of heat exhaustion and so was Holloway but the problem we did have was physical dripping uh, which didn't work it doesn't work in space Okay, reset. Yes, great. Yeah? Okay. Good. Yep. All right, cut. All right, cut there. Because we had such a great team on board, um, we managed to achieve something that I feel like was unachievable in that space, but we managed to do it. There was an outflow of steam back on the, the site. The harvester's drill anchors must have exposed a pocket on the asteroid. Obviously, our film takes place kind of 90% of the time inside of the pod. Again, we had lots of challenges in terms of space. Mayday. Hey, shape. Mayday. This is Holloway. The pod the sun's going behind it. Mm -hmm. And then we cut to there, and he comes in shot. Mm -hmm. Sorry, he grabs the lever, knows it's ready to go. The inside of the ship goes through various lighting changes. Uh, so it starts off one colour, then goes to down the colour. Because we didn't want, me and Bart, the DP, we didn't want the set to just look the same. So we wanted to try and change what we could. So one moment we're on a crane, one moment we're on a dolly, locked off on a tripod, next moment we're um, handheld. And then the lights will change. We tried to, you know, shoot the same set in so many different ways as we could. Sir, sort of Stephen out, please. Roll, please. Sound speed. Victor, 34 Apple, take one. Mark, thank you, board. Right. And action. And some of the technical achievements we'd done in that set was brilliant. And we had this light spinning on a rig, which is very inventive. And I think with low money, when you have little money and little time, you you squeeze out what talent you have and everyone's thinking on the go and well, how are we going to make this work? Well, this doesn't work, we can't do that, how are we going to do it? And I think that's when your talent shows, when it's going wrong, not when it's going right. Three, two, one, action. And one more flap. Slowly down, keep rolling. Because we wanted to keep Solace as practical as possible and not rely too much in host, we actually created the Kapira and the Hathor as miniatures. So the escape pod itself went through quite a few design aspects. DB Props then took our designs and made them into these brilliant miniatures. Um, originally it was egg-shaped. Uh, because I like the idea, it represents rebirth, because Holloway goes through his kind of transformative process. And action. It's as close as egg-shaped as we could get without it looking like a giant egg like, floating through space. Kapira is the Egyptian goddess of rebirth. She has, she has lots of names, but that's one of the many names. Hathor, uh, the name 
is the Egyptian goddess of motherhood and feminine wisdom because Roberts. Uh, for me, she kind of symbolises feminine strength, so uh, she's the hero. She saves Holloway. Holloway isn't the hero at all. Hathor, the meaning of Hathor represents Robert's quality in the film. Physically demanding? I, I, I probably whinged more than was physically demanding. It was the... Uh, the heat was probably, and the, and the just the constriction of the physical demands of the wire work and the harnesses and the the spacesuit that's tight, the constriction of everything, and having to fucking figure out how to fucking get around this. A lot of sweating. You realize like different moves, how awkward they are and how difficult they are because of the constraints of the suit and the wires and all of that shit, but again, it's, I'm hanging from fucking wires in a spacesuit. It's pretty fucking cool. You, know, you put, you keep it in perspective quick enough. Not to say I didn't get worked up, I got pissed off, and you get in, and you're like, fuck this, and you want to tear it all off. But you, then when you get ready, you, you put it in perspective, and it's like, you know, very grateful for it all. With the edit, it was a fairly kind of straightforward process. Once we had wrapped, Carl had all the footage, and he did a kind of rough assembly edit and then our editor Chris Timpson came in and just tightened it up but overall it was a very kind of simple process. I lost my daughter seven years ago. She was 12. My husband couldn't cope. Roberts was a role that we oh, knew really. we had to cast in post-production. So how we met Alice, we were actually at a uh, film festival in our local town and we screened Solace, uh, like a teaser trailer there. And she was actually sitting next to me. But it wasn't until a few weeks after that that we were like, oh, I know. Alice might actually be a really good Roberts because we were still looking for a Roberts. You're doing good, hanging on the... <laughs> <laughs> we ended up doing... Um, Alice's ADR months good. after we wrapped. She came in for, good. I think it was like two or three days uh, ADR in uh, London. The idea was to have Roberts on set while we were shooting, but because of the rush, we didn't have the time or the money. We just got a stand-in voice, um, Sally, and she done a great job because she's an actress he could work with and bounce off quite easily, rather than just having me read them out. I wouldn't want his apologies. I just want him. She didn't want to look at the image, so she was just responding to what she could hear, which is really good because there's a few mistakes in the original script where it was like, well, how does she know he's doing that? So Alice come on and sort of smoothed all that out and made it really good, and she kind of made it her own. Copy that. Brilliant. I nearly forgot to do it again. <laughs> Robert is the O2 stabilised! <laughs> Brilliant effects done all the visual effects for the film. Just like every other department in the film that had limited time and resources, where you know we couldn't achieve what we, we would have achieved with tons of time and tons of money. So a lot of that weight was shifted onto visual effects. And it's hard to imagine we were actually in that tiny set with the ceiling only feet away from Stephen. We didn't, with the miniatures, we didn't have the money to go macro detail. Really, we needed motion control rigs and we only really had the money for the miniatures themselves, so we were very careful how we shot. And that's when visual effects came in. They touched up all the miniature shots. They had our setups, our angles and our lighting. And especially the Hathor, uh, I think some shots they completely replaced digitally. And I think this merge between practical and CGI is more effective than just complete CGI. David Stone Hamilton, the composer, in order to help us fund the film, he created a sketch piece. A piece of concept art that you listen to. And it was really effective, it went down really well because we, um, 
would play when we pitched the film, we'd play it, listen to this, while you're looking at the artwork. We could only ever s collaborate over Skype and email, but um, uh, I mean, David managed to create the score together, the tones, the elements, the themes, and the emotion just through Skype. Um, and it, the first time I actually met David was the recording session in LA. And we were really lucky enough to be able to um, score this film with a live orchestra. The music is a character in the film and it often gets neglected. Um, but no, David done an amazing job. thankful to Stephen really because he was there right from the concept right through all of the years of development um, he stood by us and he stood by the project and believed in the project for all of that time um, you know, it must have been hard for Stephen because he was the only actor in the whole film he didn't have actors to bounce off but it was hard as the camera's just in his face all the time he'd done a great job carrying the film on his own I couldn't have done it without Charlotte um, because together it's 50-50. Um, yeah, I can write the scripts and I have the ideas, but that's where it ends. Charlotte actually brings me down to reality and, and makes it a thing. And she had a, such a daunting task as the producer of this film that hadn't produced a feature before, only, only these tiny short films. Uh, but she just managed it, she just coped. And it's, yeah, everyone saw it. So um, yeah, it's great. Carl was, uh, was very impressed. I said next week I'd go to work on another film with him because he's uh, great energy, calm throughout, never up and down, emotional, but it didn't mean he didn't know what he wanted and he was getting what he wanted and he was open to talking uh, about things and changes. But then when there were some changes I really fucking wanted and he didn't want, he was able to communicate them and such and we compromised. Uh, really. Louis Lifetimer. Again, like this is this is what you dream of is to have an experience like this where you're working every day, six days a week. Not always easy, long hours. Give me a couple days off and like, okay, let's get to work. Let's do another one on Monday. And that that is completely reflective of Carl. None of that would be without Carl. And for a first time filmmaker to run this, blown away. Going away. Really impressed. I'm really pleased with what we achieved for Solace. I'm a self taught filmmaker. I didn't go to film school. I taught myself how to do budgets, how to do scheduling, and I think that's very daunting um, for anyone who's kind of trying to break into the film industry. You have this perception that you have to have gone to film school, you have to have known all these things. With the time, the money, and the resources that we were given, I'm just really proud of what we've achieved. Just going for it and having faith in yourself and having passion in what you're doing. And I think that's just the best thing to do if you're, you know, a first time producer or, you know, going into your first feature film because it is scary and it is um, daunting and overwhelming sometimes, but you just gotta go for it. And you know, if this is something you wanna do, you know, to write, direct, anything, um, you just gotta believe in yourself because you're the only person who will for a certain amount of time until you get that break and just keep going, just don't give up. Because the day you do give up, you don't know how close you are. From the moment of, ah, oh, we're gonna make a feature film to making solace, it's 10 years. Um, of finally finding the money and that's years of scripts of writing managing normal jobs paying the bills and then having all these false promises not going anywhere it's hard you can't give up on like the 10th fail you have to just keep going